Okay, welcome everybody. Let's get started here. This is the hair and the logo of Caraboot. It kind of describes that Caraboot is fast and goes away from your site over fast. So, who am I? Gösti Malke. I've been with the Caraboot project since 2010. It's like six years. Uh, I've taken part of this Google Summer of Code as an intern two times. Done a little bit of kind of user support work on USB debug, backporting features from uh, commercial size of Coreboot, as known as Core, uh, Chromebooks. And I've also worked on this serialized parser thing. It's a reverse engineering tool, which is kind of part of Coreboot also. Um, I tend to be more interested on the industrial side of things rather than uh, commercial devices like uh, uh, Chromebooks present, but uh, the interest, industrial side is also coming to color boot with a force, I believe. So, what is color boot? How many of you have heard about this beforehand? That's about Half. Okay, great. So we are a project that tries to replace the firmware that is proprietary present in current mainboards. We are talking about the initialization code around the main CPU mainly. Uh, there are sub projects and interests on different parts of the computer that also have firmware but we don't always count them as part of the color boot proper. And the idea of what makes color boot fast is that we do as little as possible and get out of the way. Um, so it's proven to scale from tablet devices to clusters with thousands and thousands of nodes in supercomputer clusters. Um, and that's where the project actually uh, started from. So if you go back to the days of 1999 at the Los Alamos National Laboratories in the US, a man called Ron Minich started this project when they had problems in a supercomputing cluster and the vendor bias just wasn't flexible enough for their needs. The original idea was to reuse the Linux kernel placed inside the BIOS ROM. Uh, the benefit of this was to avoid rewriting drivers for exotic hardware, hardware like uh, InfiniBand that they had in their cluster. Um, but it became clear soon that actually, for example, Linux kernel, it is unable to initialize the hardware from scratch. Uh, the involvement in memory technology as dynamic RAM and uh, PCI Express later on uh, forced that a lot of new chipset initialization code was required. Uh, but this didn't exist in the kernel, so they had to re uh, write a lot of new firmware code from scratch. Uh, at that time, this was usually done in assembler language, but it was hard to validate and as I said, the uh, development in the hardware itself caused that it was not practical at all. So they wanted to write the firmware changes in C code. Uh, at that time, they were doing with x86 architecture mostly. And if you know about x86 main boards and CPUs, there is usually no static RAM present. So the question is, how do you 
create uh, complex code written in C when you have no stack. And because of this, they had to use a special compiler known as ROMCC, which had a lot of issues. It couldn't be debugged basically uh, at all. Uh, I mean, the object files did not follow any common format. So there was a discovery with a CPU technology known as Cache SRAM. And with that taken into the development, they could use standard GNU tool chain and all the commonly available tools, and it kind of speeded up the development pro process. Um, <clears throat> So the early objectives, what were the goals? They were running a cluster of nodes, thousands, thousands of nodes maybe. So a boot failure wasn't really an option. How do you go about in an installation when you have systems installed in racks, have no keyboards, have no displays? Okay, there was a case. Press F1 to continue. Yeah, that's nice. And it happened. As for firmware upgrade, it just decided that, okay, we have to reload the defaults because some, some parameter in firmware had changed. We need to revert to the default parameters. And after that, the nodes decided, okay, let's tell the user that the defaults have been loaded and request him or her to press F1. You can imagine if it was fun or not. Uh, fast. So Linux BIOS wanted to be fast. Uh, those were server boards, not necessarily booted very often, but they had lots of RAM, multiple processes. Uh, one of the things that made, could, made it faster than normal was to run things in parallel, just doing ECC scrubbing parallel across different CPUs helped a lot. More goals, flexible. We might not want to boot only the Linux. We might want to boot other operating systems also. And we might want to boot over network. Computing nodes do not necessarily have local hard drives. And if you have an exotic network controller, like in this case, they had InfiniBand, they didn't want to write the drivers in EFI or something to work together with the vendor bias. And using open source software like IPXC, I guess it was called Etherboot back then, it was possible. Okay, unintended, unintended means that user input should be the very, very last resort in a firmware to boot the hardware. And write firmware in C, please. Uh, I guess the options then were assembler, fourth, maybe something else, I don't know. So this was basically from around 1999 to say mid-2000. 2005 or so in Los Alamos National Laboratories on the US. So we move on, how do we call it Core Boot nowadays? Uh, it, were, it was realized that the Linux kernel didn't actually do the tasks that we wanted to do, so we were no longer putting Linux kernel into the BIOS firmware. And also, if we were to boot a current <laughs> operating system, we would not be relying on BIOS services. So the original name combination of, of Linux BIOS was kind of a misnomer. And the name Core Boot refers to booting the core chipset parts. 
no hard drives, no USB disks, no keyboard, no graphics. Just the Core chipset in the main board. Uh, those days, we're talking around 2005 to 2010 in this part. Uh, AMD was actively involved by contributing source code into the project, whereas Intel was, Intel was very much closed doors, no data sheets. Uh, so the community was pretty much focused on AMD desktop boards, some embedded applications around like AMD Gaude, LXGX, if you're familiar with those names. Um, they were quite popular in kiosk applications, uh, information displays, everywhere where you want long-term reliability combined with low power and you don't have huge needs for uh, computing power. So the development had to sort of move towards Europe there was active development in Germany, especially. Uh, German government funded re half reverse engineering work of an Intel chipset for defense and military purposes on a rockerized laptop. And the reason for this was increased awareness on firmware security especially around Intel system management mode at that time. And the t uh, this funding resulted with the support on a specific Intel 945 chipset on mobile devices. And this particular chipset became kind of a new trigger wave uh, of interest towards end users because for, for the first time there was a laptop, commercial available consumer grade laptop with open firmware. This was particularly the ThinkPad T60 and X60, which later on triggered things like Glugluk and LibreBoot, which we will briefly discuss later on. Uh, also, quality assurance became an important fact. Automated test benches that uh, constantly run, the, run checks on firmware changes that uh, the developers make were introduced. And since we're dealing with laptop hardware now, power management features became important. Yep. So we now turn into the year 2012, car booting Chrome OS. What happened then at the US soil? Uh, so Chrome OS is the Google's uh, operating system shipped with Chromebooks, for example. First models released in 2012 that came with car boot. Uh, there were some previous models before that, but they don't boot with Core Boot. So 2012, the devices were introduced. 2013, 2.9 million units sold. 2016, forecast, 8 million units. This year, in the US, Chromebooks sold more than max. So there were new requirements on the Core Boot project. That was the development was commercially done within Google. So the new goals need to use latest silicons, need to get the industry involved in the process. So it was no longer option to develop by reverse engineering methods and use five year old hardware. Large scale mass production. You saw the unit numbers in the previous slide. Uh, the complete development uh, team had to adapt 
to a different uh, development pace that the laptop market requires. I mean, the design time from a reference, pre reference design to make the product appear in the shops. Uh, that time had to be optimized and that required that the development team um, and the industry worked together. On the Chrome Boost, Chrome OS, the safety was a big issue. We are, we are going to refer to the verified proof process later on. I'll skip it at the moment. And lately, last the forced firmware update the deployment. Uh, once again, boot failure is not an option. Uh, the firmware was going to be updated remotely on user's laptop without their uh, special acceptance, so to say. So it just, it just pushed there into the system. We are going to talk a little bit about how that works also. Okay. We're going to move on to a little bit more technical part now. Uh, I hope you can hear me well and understand me well. At least nobody's kind of, oh my God, I can't hear a thing. Great. So a more technical presentation now follows. Uh, the Cutter Boot proper is under GPL version 2 license. As we spoke earlier, it's mostly C, partially assembler language. We are going through three stages in the boot. Those are built as separate binaries in the firmware. We also put into the firmware description of how the build was made so that it can be remade from, remade from the parameters afterwards. So payloads, we don't count payload, which is the part that follows the Corpus Prover. Uh, we, don't, mm, we don't necessarily build it ourselves. Uh, we are, Build system does support building it, but it can be also brought in as a separate binary. And then there are proprietary components in the firmware image. These can, these are closed source, can be nasty, are security threats. Nobody likes them, but they are there. And with today's x86, if you want a recent hardware, you cannot really avoid them. Uh, we can go into in-depth discussion about some of these later on, maybe in the question section. Or do you have a question there? Sorry, when you're dealing with software in the setting of running uh, after the operating system uh, boots, uh, you have some uh, deliberations about how that how that works with uh, binary blobs and stuff like that. But you're using the GPL uh, yep. here, and now uh, to me this is these are all new considerations. How how does uh, GPL uh, work with inserting binary blobs from the firmware? Excellent question. Uh, then again, I have to first start saying but by that I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an expert on copyright law, et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, we're living in firmware world. We have to remember that there is no concept of a process. There's no concept of memory space separation. There's no inter-process communication. 
uh, what do you have left when you have a need to go to pr production with very recent silicon where the chipset or hardware vendor will not provide the source code. So it's sort of a big compromise between two worlds. Either you're stuck with 10-year-old uh, hardware or then you make a compromise about accepting some binary blobs. So if we're thinking about the alternative here, the alternative would have been that the whole Coreboot project would have deceased most likely in the x86 world if it wasn't for the fact that there was, you know, the, the, there was this compromise that let's figure out what is important in this binary world and when we think from the security perspective of things if, if you have Intel management engine in the hardware then it doesn't really matter from the security perspective even if the chipset initialization code is not available in source code because the validation is sort of pointless for that part. I, I, uh, so I understand technical perspectives uh, of it, but it's, uh, but, uh, uh, and as you said, you're not a lawyer, but, uh, but I'm a little bit, uh, um, we say curious about yeah. uh, how that that works, especially as you say, there is no there is no real separation between uh, processes well, there. So it's it's kind of a more integral part of uh, of the program. Yeah. But uh, I'm I'm not going to press you on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I will continue with that on, uh, by saying that uh, there is a defined API that is also used outside Core Boot, like with the Intel FSB. It's not strictly built for Core Boot. And um, and uh, as I told, they are separate binaries. They are not linked at compiler or linker level together. We can speculate if it's linking then we have we are making calls there there's no question that we're making calls from gpl code to proprietary but it's borderline legal issue i would i would dare to say that it's borderline legal issue but it hasn't been taken into court so yeah i hope that partially answers your question uh, so i'm not sure if you can read this this is a basically layout of the firmware image. I will skip it for now. So we had three stages in the firmware boot block, x86 boot block, mostly assembler, some C. We just take the x86 processor out of its misery and the 60-bit world, so we can access 32-bit bits worth of memory that is four gigabytes. Then we enhance the boot media access to, to, uh, to boot faster. We can, uh, for example, uh, use a higher clock rate on the SPI flash device. Boot block was usually about one kilobyte or two kilobytes of code compiled. Now, uh, RAM stage, so this does basic, GP, uh, basic chipset I.O. settings. Every main board or every chipset has a bit different schematic layout, so we deal with that. We enable some debug logging. We can put the debug logs over serial port. We can put it into RAM afterwards, or we can send it over USB. Uh, the most important part of the ROM stage is to set up 
the system DRAM controller and it's also called training, training the memory. And at la uh, uh, as last part of ROM state, we migrate away from cache as RAM. So I'll describe cache as RAM very, very briefly. Uh, it's a method of utilizing the CPU cache lines as a static RAM. So since the dynamic RAM is not available, available we can push the C runtime stack on the CPU cache lines. And once we have RAM ready, we can copy the relevant parts from the cache lines to RAM. For example, the system debug lock that will, that will be copied into the RAM. Okay, RAM stage. We are doing multiprocessor in it, microcode updates, PCI device enumeration, figure out the overall memory map, configuration of the hardware, create some tables like ACP and SMBIOS for the operating system. And what we also do is remember how the RAM training results were and put, to, put, put those into the SPI flash for later use. Uh, I script the SMM there. We lock the system management mode memory with as little code as possible. It's a potential security attack surface. And most of the things that were someday necessary to be done in the system management mode can nowadays be done with the ACPI in a more safe manner. Do you want to make any guesses how long the boot process has taken to get to this point? Seconds, minutes? Any, anyone? This is done from the timestamps that we collect during the boot process. I, I will tell you the lines because the text is so, so small. So we exit the boot block essentially in 40 milliseconds. Uh, we get past ROM stage in about 600 milliseconds when we boot the hardware the first time. And we have completed the ROM stage in about one second. But this is all the very first time boot of the platform. As I told you, we save the RAM training results. Uh, the RAM training takes about 500 milliseconds. So the next time we boot, we're down to 200 milliseconds from the one second that it was previously. Then if you want to utilize this uh, suspend S3 suspend mode available in the system, S3 suspend is the deepest sleep state that maintains the memory contents. Yes? Uh, if you change the RAM or something on the platform, are you... Uh... Okay. Are you ch uh checking for some kind of unique IDs on the RAM or something? Yeah. Uh, if if the RAM is changed, uh, the system will tolerate and detect that and then redo the RAM training. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if we're, we're going to use S3 suspend mode, the firmware, firmware can exit in about 180 milliseconds and then it will take some time from the operating system to also recover until you get back into normal user mode. So the last stage of the firmware we consider is the payload stage. This is where you can choose your license freely. This is where all your user in interaction happens hard disks, USB disks, 
or USB drives, file systems, and the OS bootloader lives. So these are all parameters you could affect and optimize to your liking without affecting the actual hardware initialization part. So choice of a payload, CBIOS, it provides BIOS services if you want to put DOS or Windows. Grab2, there's no DOS services, uh, there are no BIOS services, but you can put Linux kernels. Uh, IPXC, if you want network booting. Memtest86, you probably know what that is good for, testing that platform RAM is configured correctly. The Anocoder, it's a UEFI compliant, you can boot Windows 10, you can boot also OS X on Chromebooks. The hardware doesn't have to be Macintosh. Uh, depth charge, it's the one used on Chromebooks. It does fancy graphical user interface things. Uh, Linux as a payload, you can put Linux kernel into the, into the flash once again. It's sort of experimental stage at the moment. Philo, a very, very basic one. It can load the kernel and boot without much user interface. Uh, Tint by your correction for NVRAM GUI. This is sort of, they won't get you into the operating system and all. They are more for demonstrational purposes of what payloads can do. And we have a support library called libpayload. If you want to write your own payload, you don't have to start from scratch. Okay, so if you're interested, okay, this is great, I want Coreboot, what should you do? Well, the bad news is that it's strictly coupled with the hardware. There's a set of main boards that you have to purchase if you want to try Coreboot. So the choices are purchase new hardware, purchase used hardware, purchase used hardware that already has a code boot installed, or do it yourself with attitude from scratch for a new board, that is. So about the new hardware available, Chromebooks or Chrome OS hardware. I tend to say Chrome OS hardware now because there will be also tablets that boot with Coreboot. You will get latest silicons, latest chipsets. They are relatively cheap hardware. I don't know what the situation is here in Norway, how well they are available in stores. You need to check that out yourselves. Uh, the bad thing, you don't get open source chipset initialization. They, since we are dealing with latest silicons, you're forced to have some binary blobs there. Um, you can install the operating system of your choice, but Chromebooks usually have little RAM, little SSD, maybe not uh, wired networking maybe no mobile telecom possibility and so on. Other than that, they are easy to take apart and replace the firmware. So that's a bonus compared to ThinkPads, for example. If you don't want to buy a Chromebook, not, every, not everybody likes the form factor or keyboard, so touchpads on Chromebooks, you can try LibreBoot and Minifree. Uh, Libreboot leaves out the binary blobs with some uh, with sub, some expense maybe in the operational quality of the operating system, especially microcode updates are something that you really should not leave out. Uh, but they provide pre-built and tested firmware images for certain models. And the bonus is if you buy 
one of the laptops from Minifree. All the profits go in the Libreboot project development. And they also have reached free software, free software foundations, respect your freedom certification, which means that also the operating system installed on those uh, on that hardware will be free of binary components. Uh, other new hardware available, PC engines, APU1, APU2, they are router appliances, AMD based. Uh, the later one has uh, binary components that are not available as open source. Uh, Purism, it doesn't ship with Kerboot, at least not yet. They have good intentions. Sometimes I feel that they are more or they are over optimistic in their marketing team, but they are still worth following, especially if they come up with a laptop that actually ships with Kerboot. Uh, risk V. Low risk, power rate, IBM Open Power Talos. These are non x86 projects. Uh, we have quite deep demonstrations or quite detailed demonstrations about these uh, as video streams. So, just something that you should be aware of if you have security concerns of x86. So we're moving on to how to how to install Kota Boot. We use a reference tool chain to build, and we have an open repository, uh, anonymous repository, where you can download source code from. Uh, we have a repository of builds that are known to work for a certain laptop, and also. If you take a recent color boot image, you can reproduce it as an identical binary from scratch with the configuration files that are also present in the image. Just a quick demo follows about the build, how it looks like, how it looks like. Can you see this at all? Okay, at least some of you. It's similar to Linux kernel configuration, where you select the main board you want to build for. Let's take, for example, ASRock. Select the board. Okay, we're happy with that configuration. Choose, for example, consoles. Do we want serial port? Yes, no. Do we want to? Do we want to keep the console lock also in the RAM? So we, this is the basic interface for you to configure the build. Oh, I jumped. Well, let's get back to where we were. No. Come on. Sorry about this. I didn't realize it was going to reset to. Okay. Now we're getting there. Slowly. Thank God. Okay. One more. No. Okay. So, assuming you have now built the Kodo boot, <laughs> so we kind of skip a lot of the steps that are required to build the Kodo boot image because it's just running make basically. That does the complete firmware build. Um, we're trying to flash it for the first time, and it doesn't work. Very far failed. So what happens is that. Today's vendor firmware is secure enough in that you cannot write the firmware of your choice unless you do it using an external programmer device. Uh, 
So the hardware tools you're going to need. Okay, laptop disassembly, not funny. You have to do it. Uh, you have to get physical access to the actual SPI flash part. You might need some soldering skills. The, the parts are tiny, by the way. And you will need a pro programmer hardware. Okay, now, hey, it works. What, it may happen it works. Uh, the feature up, update of the firmware is easier. You can do it from the command line, uh, assuming you don't lock the firmware. And really, you should lock the firmware, but most of us don't. Uh, if you don't lock it, you can now configure the payload, change payload, and a fallback normal recovery layout means that you, if you mess up, you may not need to take the laptop part completely apart again, but you can recover to operating system and use the flash room common line tool. Sometimes you get frustrated along the process, ask for help. Uh, Okay, confusion about pinout. These are mainly electrical issues you may encounter while you're trying to write the firmware. It happens to everybody, don't be afraid. Okay, so this was the first part that's mostly about Kerboot. After the questions and answers, which will be at the very end of the presentations, uh, we have some demo, hands-on demo. It's not practical to, to try to do the demo over the projector because the laptops don't enable the external display. So we'll look about that later on. A few words on firmware security will follow. Uh, as I said, the first flashing of a quarter boot over the vendor will fail. Uh, it's due to the awareness of how important it is to secure your firmware. It's everywhere and it can talk to various devices on the mainboard platform. Just imagine an example of an embedded controller uh, which is responsible of translating all your key presses. What could it do and how easy it would be to implement a malware in it? Just capture, say, the very first 50 key presses after you power on the device and save that in clear form somewhere else in the platform. Now, what would be the first 50 key presses you enter? What could they be? Could it be passphrase? Could it be login password? You, know, you, you name it. Also, firmware is a perfect hiding place. It's usually not available for the operating system. It can be of a micro architecture we don't even know of. We may not be able to read the firmware in the first place. And still we should be able to trust on it. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the concept of root of trust? So I, was, I said that firmware should be the root of trust. So starting from below, uh, if you cannot trust your firmware, then you shouldn't trust the bootloader. If you cannot tr trust the bootloader, you cannot trust the OS. If you cannot trust the OS, how do you know your applications are secure? If your applications are not secure, who has access to your bank account in the worst case? So we have several methods of SPI flash protection. Uh, using these methods combined should protect the firmware in your hardware. But the consequence is that once you apply those methods, you're also locking yourself out from doing a quarter boot upgrade on that system. So we are now moving towards a verified boot. Uh, 
where the boot block of the firmware is signed with the vendor's private key. This is implemented as Intel boot card known as verified boot. And the consequence of that is that while we can write a custom firmware on the flash, we will fail the boot block signature check and the system will not boot. And in the long run, this method would lock us from doing any color boot installations on such systems. And it's already known to affect some think about models in the market. Uh, so we would like to have a decent upgrade path also with Coder Boot. And this is the basic method that is uh, implemented with the Chromebooks. We store a, our own public key in read-only firmware in the SPI flash. Then we keep two copies of read-writable firmware, one that we can update using flash ROM. We create the root of trust by making the read-only part verify the read-write part, and read-write part verifies the kernel. This allows things like key revocation, implementation in the you know, chain of trust. Uh, this was about the verified boot. Uh, are there students present? Okay, then I will skip the Google Summer of Code part. This doesn't apply to you. So where can you meet some of the developers? We are present at free open source software events, plugfests. These are the few that I know of. Uh, whether we participate in CCC or FOSDEM is yet to be decided. The Coderboot Convention in Denver, it's more of a developer meeting, but I think end users would be welcome there also. Uh, that sort of concludes the presentation part. Uh, as I told, there will be a hands-on demo later. Uh, can I, I could have more questions now if, if you have any. And we can also scroll back to some of the slides if you think I've skipped uh, some detail you want to know about. Yeah, uh, I'm just curious. Um, say you have a recent Chromebook, which you put uh, core boot on, and then you use uh, Linux as the payload. How fast does it actually boot? Because it sounds like Linux has a payload, something you would do for performance. So I'm rather curious about how fast it actually gets to the login stage. OK. Uh, the Linux as a payload with current devices is a pretty new thing. Uh, I don't have any uh, statistics or instrumentation about that. Um, one major player in the game is how the operating system and the, operating, uh, and the file system and the initial RAM disks of the operating system itself works. So that's kind of out of the scope of the Coder Boot firmware to decide how, how fast we are from loading the kernel and their, their own. So with, uh, even without Linux as a payload, we have seen uh, Chromebooks get into a graphical user interface within, I guess, five seconds or better. Okay. This is just a. Payload. Is that strictly for performance, or is there some other reason that you would might want to do that? Uh, some of the early reasons that were present in the clusters, uh, like having exotic hardware and reducing device drivers in the firmware would be one reason. Uh, another reason is to minimize, again, the attack surface. Leaving out bootloader means you have 
less of a attack surface or less of a less sources you need to verify for security flaws. Cool, thank you. It's just a response to you, but uh, I can't really remember. Okay, can you I speak would, a bit louder? Uh, I can try. Uh, it's only for recording, the okay. microphone is uh, recording. So, uh, I was only uh, briefly involved in that project, but... Uh, which I missed the beginning of your question. No, it's not a question, it's an answer to, uh, oh. to him. I was only briefly involved uh, in a project where uh, we wanted to load an operating system on a router uh, and uh, to chain load uh, the Linux system uh, directly there uh, gave us the uh, ability to actually initialize uh, uh, more devices before, uh, before uh, loading the proper system. Um, which it was sort of a special case because uh, I can't really remember, but Grub was not an, uh, an option and Lilo was too restricted. So if we could jump directly into the uh, into the operating uh, system, we could actually be able to initialize uh, some special drivers. So yeah. there there are special cases yeah. where this sounds very much of the same same reasoning or same. Same idea that was in the original supercluster business to use exotic kernel drivers to to get flexibility in the boot. Okay, if there are mo no more questions, we can continue with the free discussion. But before that. Uh, uh, I'll do a little bit of rearrangement of hardware and we have uh, some hands-on demo outside the presentation, unfortunately. So five minutes and we'll continue with hands-on demo. <laughs> 